a happy heart, but also one filled with joy and excitement and elation to have so many friendly faces here. But I introduce you, but I introduce all of us, <coughs> so, to, the, to the series finale of a show that has been doing so much for so many for so long. The show and talk, talk show. It's been a big week for goodbyes. Mad Men, Letter Men, Grow Smaller Men. And they've been great. They've been healthy. They've not been the focus. But I am proud tonight to present to you, in her finale, from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Lori Felker! Next to you, I'm far in front of you, 
so you need that television to see me, but all this stuff is real, and I'm real, and this is the real me. I keep about, I'm blocking that, I bet, a lot, huh? Uh, this is the real me, these are my bones, and I wanted you to see me. I wanted you to see my real self. That's funny. Uh, those are my real bones, but if I turn around, I break, I break the TV thing a little bit because you actually see further into the darkness, into my soul. And I'm going to try to keep the bones up front as much as possible so you get to see me, okay? But I just want you to know that this is real. And maybe we'll start off with a little game, and because most people, they say they don't know how old I am most of the time, so I'm wondering if you guys could all just guess how old I am. 17! <laughs> introduce you to Jared. Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Jared's like my best friend and um, we're so excited you could be here for us for our Halloween show. I don't know why we're dressed like this. <laughs> um, and most of all, of course, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Show me something, everybody. You just like, just show me something. I want to see something from everybody. Oh, that's a nice umbrella. Ooh. Opportunist by Flossies? I don't know what that is. I'm not very cool. An adventure card and a pencil, and there's some clothes in Paris. Stop, thank you for taking me there. Alexander really wants to show me his glasses. And that's a photo. Oh, that looks really cool. This is fun. Oh, that's my sign. And key thing. Okay. Well, I really want to. Oh, can I get a piece of gum? Thanks. Can you get it out for me? Thanks. Um, and I really kind of want to have all this stuff. What did you bring, Drew? What is that? Nice Ooh! I needed one of those yesterday. Thank you. And a pen. No, no, I don't smoke. Thank you. I really kind of want all of this stuff, but I know I can't have it. I know I can't. That wouldn't be very nice of me. I mean, I have all this stuff. I have a pen and a ball, and that's not mine. Jared's mine. He's my friend. Um, so I'm wondering if all of you could do me a favor, and if you could all give me something. And if you could all just take a picture of something, um, right now. And, and, and what, if it could be the thing that you brought, or it could be anything, it could be a picture of me. And if you could just email it to me right now, that'd be super cool. Because I want to collect something from all of you. I really want to have a lot of stuff. It might help me sell my sketchbook. Which, you know, is very important. Ooh, Jared. Yeah? It's hard to get over the gloomies. They just don't go away as easy as they come. <sighs> How's it going? Jared, you want to play a little song for them while they're, they're taking pictures and emailing? Emailing can take a while, can it, huh? So my, my name is real complicated. Lori Felker, not Felkest, but yes, the Felker. It's okay. It's better than just being Felk. What you put on the subject line? This, oh, that's a good question. Subject line. Adam, what do you... Adam's going to receive all of them. Um, live to tape. Oh, yeah. Yay! Hashtag. Hashtag live to tape. And if anybody wants cookies throughout the show, the Andy Kaufman Memorial Cookies, you're welcome to grab some cookies. He's my favorite. That made me sad, too. I cried when I read that Bob's Blue book. Yeah? Did you cry? No, I just read it. You just read it? I cried. <laughs> Even though I already knew Andy Kaufman was dead, I cried anyway when he died. Did you cry when you shut the Viaduct Theater down? No. Because <laughs> we're here. Do you yeah. remember when there was the movie? Yeah. Okay, you guys done? Okay, you're done. Okay, cool. <laughs> Ad living sucks, huh? <laughs> so now we're going to play a game, and it's called Is This Rice? <laughs> Is this 
rice. Oh, Jared, it doesn't work. Tell them the trick. <laughs> so the trick is, this is fun, I'll just teach you the game so you can play with your friends. What you do is you put um, a piece of rice on the end of your finger, but mine with a stick, and you walk around and you go, hey, is this rice? And you say, is this rice? And then you just keep pointing at stuff, and they're like, no, that's not rice, that's, a, that's the Grateful Dead, or that's a Spanish Harlem, or like, that's a, a pair of pants. And then you're like, no, 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 this! Because, you know, how do you point at the thing that's on the stuff? That, on the end of your finger. <laughs> Thank you. I bought, I bought new rice for that, and it, it was stickier, and now it's not sticky anymore. You should have gone to sticky rice, there's two of them. Is this rice? It makes you think, is this nice? Uh, wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. Can you, do you know that song? No. Okay. Uh, I'm, oh look, a basket. What's in this basket, Jared? Do you know? I can't see it. Huh. <laughs> it's a nice little picnic basket here on this hill. This is really pretty. This kind of makes me want to maybe just sit down and see. Get a friends! So excited! Who's this first friend? Everybody's help. Just... Oh, 
They're still paying for certain things. I'm 31. I'm almost to be 32. That's not good. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the first. Uh, does anyone know where the first stop sign was? The first stop sign was uh, right outside of my dad's apartment because it told him to stop having no kids so that he could have me. Uh, my dad called me and uh, I was talking to us. And it, he noticed that I was 28, and he said, you know, oh, Jared, I, uh, I had you when I was 28. <laughs> you know, like, sort of that, he, he's pretty good about the not too much pressure about, like, having kids and that sort of thing. Uh, but he, uh, yeah, the 28 thing, sorry, my set list is, uh, don't know my foot. Dad having kids, 28. All right. Uh, and, and, and then another time he called me, and it was a message. Well, he wasn't even talking to me. He left a message, it just, uh, I think sometime in the summer, asking me, he said, uh, Oh, Jared, if, uh, if you ever do get married, uh, don't get married on Black Friday. Because uh, my dad works at Sears. He goes, it's really hard to get time off on Black Friday. And uh, if you got married, which we hadn't been talking about, I'd want to be there. So just don't get married on Black Friday. So, it would be hard to get that time off. It, it, it's the same sort of cut. Like when he comes to visit me in Chicago, uh, he ran on a bus and, you know, I'm talking about something else, and he turns to me and he goes, I'm so proud you were a catcher in Little League. That's the hardest position. Which is an incredibly nice thing to say, but I feel like I get a lot of those comments from him, so I'm like, Dad, oh, fine, thank you. Like, but it just, I was like, where does that come from? And he just looks at me and he thinks of, me being a catcher, the hardest position. And some people say it's a pitcher, but it's not, it's the catcher. Little fact for you. <laughs> uh, okay, so how many people here are, are video makers or uh, filmmakers, right? Okay. Yeah. okay. Do you guys call it Final Cut Pro or Final Cut Professional? <laughs> All right, that's just for those guys. Thanks uh, the rest of you for sticking around. Uh, <clears throat> okay, oh, bus stuff. Have you guys ever written the old, uh, what is it? It's Belmont the 77, I think? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 77. Okay. 
This has been pretty consistent. There's this woman who's a bus driver. I love noticing when bus drivers are like really by the book, you know, meaning they will not let you off early before the stop. They never will. And there's bus drivers who are really not by the book. They're like, you can get off here, it's fine. I'm gonna go through this kind of red light. This one woman is very by the book. I've gotten her several Tuesdays in a row uh, around, I'm at Belmont and Clark around 11, 11.30. She announces the stop. She turns off the voice, whatever that little pad they have up there. She presses the button that turns off that voice announcing it, and she announces all the stops. Also, I was on the bus, and there was someone in the back listening their, to their headphones too loud. And she said, excuse me in the back. You're listening to your headphones too loud. Can you turn it down a little bit? I'm really for that, because I always want to tell people that, but you can't because they'll give you a dirty look, and it's kind of rude for me to tell that to that guy. I mean, why can't I just wear headphones or something? That's what it's come to. But she asked the guy, and when it didn't work, she used the microphone, that microphone they never use. She pulled it down and louder said, Can you please turn that down a few notches? It's a little loud. This woman is amazing. She even refused service to somebody. She refused service to some, or someone tried to get on the bus, and then they left. And this guy was like, why did that woman, why did you not let her out or why did she leave? Was, they had a history. This woman apparently gets on the bus and starts, according to the bus driver, using foul language, insulting the customers and spitting on the floor. And the bus driver said, she knows that I will not put up with that. Like this woman's work, if you want to experience her work, this is her life's work. As a bus driver, it's really something to uh, experience. It's amazing. <laughs> Okay, uh, one last thing. Uh, my, my girlfriend and I went to Starve Rock the other day, and there was this little, like, nine-year-old, and, and he was walking by us, and he just had a, a vest, like, just a vest on, you know, bare chest and a vest. And when that's walking by you, you know you can't, like, freak out when he's there and, like, point and laugh, so he very calmly walked, and as soon as he was gone, you know, I looked at Jack, and she had seen it, too, and she said, like, wasn't that amazing? This kid, you know, being like, Mom, that's what I want to wear. I just want to wear a vest and just nothing else. And we talked about how it was amazing and kind of cute. And, and then we talked about as, as he gets older, if he continued to wear that outfit, it would get less cute. It would get, you know, it would get annoying. It would get sad. Or, you know, once you brought up, maybe as it goes on, it's just always sad. It gets to different levels of annoying, irritating, just bad. And, what, like, I've been trying to apply that for other things, like, is it bad as I get older to still, you know, spend a large amount of money on this silly, <laughs> this silly synthesizer that I wanted for 15 years, you know, to check Craigslist very often, and finally, when I find one that's a good deal, go for it. Maybe it's sad, I don't know, but I like it, that's my mess. Thank you, guys. <laughs> play a game, because I like a little drama in my life. You guys like drama? Yeah. You may have seen Jared and I uh, play this game before live in the other room. Uh, it was called Dramatics. This is a slight variation on the theme. They have please get cookies. I will not feel upset if you block my show. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm wondering if I could get someone who wants to draw and someone who wants to guess to come up here for this next segment. Who wants? You want to draw? Okay. They were gonna draw. Who wants to guess? Okay, Josh, come on up here. paper so you can see what she's doing. There's markers there on the floor. You can take your pick. There's sharpies with wide edges and there's a real stinky marker there too. And I left on the floor and my cat was sniffing the other day and I thought that would be kind of cool. Um, and so Lyra, I'm going to ask you a question and you're going to answer the question with a drawing. And then Josh has to guess what your answer is. So you're showing but he's telling. Okay. Okay. And so um, however complicated the question might be, Okay. Let's just do this one. This is good. Okay. 
So if you could draw your favorite story to tell at parties, and you have one minute. <laughs> and Josh, keep guessing, just start talking. An octopus, uh, it's a story about an octopus, it's a story about the sea, it's a story about the time you were at the beach, uh, it's a story about the time you went to the aquarium, um, it's a story about an octopus in a dress, uh, it's a story about an octopus uh, with a bib at a restaurant. Oh, time's up, everybody. Does anyone else have a better guess what the story's about that Lara really likes to tell at parties? Tyson, do you know what does her husband to be know what the story is? Fucked by an octopus. Whoa! Hey! Whoa, well, kids, cover your ears. Lara, can you tell us what the story is? It's a joke about an octopus. It's a dirty joke. Uh, do you guys want to hear the dirty joke about that? Yeah. I shouldn't have drawn an octopus. I don't even remember the joke. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you that. Come on. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, check on Facebook. She'll post it on Facebook tomorrow. Or she'll email me and I'll post it. Okay. Thank you, Lyra and Josh. <laughs> Drawer. Drawer? Drawer. A whole chest of drawers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, do you want to draw or do you want to guess? What do you guys want to draw? Draw? Do you want to guess? Sure. Yeah, come on up. She says, okay, draw a triangle. And we draws a triangle. And then she says, draw three circles in the middle of that triangle. And we draws that. She says, draw like a soft bar without hand gestures up at the top of that triangle. And then Emily has to guess what she is drawing. Whoa. See what I mean? Okay? It's tricky. 
So you don't want to make it too complicated, but it has to be something that you can describe with basic shapes. You got it? Do you have an idea of what you want to do? So many. Yeah? <laughs> so where are you left-handed or right-handed? You're going to draw on that hand? Okay, so Chris, if you want to stand over here, and I'll give you the microphone. Laurie, how much time on the clock? I'm going to do it 30 to 45 rather than a minute. Yeah, okay, sounds good. So Emily, while you're drawing, you're just guessing. So you gotta shout out like, I know what I'm drawing, drawing like the Peace Corps worker. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm a mind reader. Starting now. Okay, go! So draw a circle and put a dot in the middle of it. And then draw a rectangle around that circle. That is great. If you could now draw a tiny Right angle, <laughs> starting in the top right corner. Good. A little, a little lower. Yeah, that's perfect. And then uh, right, no, I'm sorry, other way. That's good. Leave that there. Perfect. So now if you get in the middle of that tiny box you've drawn, draw a line headed down. Keep going. Further. And now head a little longer. Now head towards the circle. Good. Now bring that line back up. And oh no, oh, oh too far. That's fine. Bring that line back down a little. Um, now go back to the other line. It's almost like an L backwards on the side. Now let's leave that. If you can draw some lines around the circle. Oh, time's up. Time's up. I think. <coughs> I know. Does anyone know what it is? Yes. Okay, Ken. What is it? Turntable. Is it a turntable? It is a turntable. Oh. Really funny, weird looking stuff. I really thought it was a boob on TV for a while. Oh. I, like, I think Emily's pretty close thinking it was some kind of a field, right? That's yeah. like a four square or whatever soccer square field. Um, oh my goodness. Wait, shh, shh, shh. Do you guys hear that? Did you hear a sparkle donkey? I, I think. Is it? I think it's Sparkle Donkey, guys. You guys remember Sparkle Donkey? Yeah. Here for me. Sparkle Donkey. Hi, my kids. Hi, Sparkle. Do it again. Yeah. So funny. Oh wow. It's just a bunch of code 
that gets eaten by the computer said, leave it your house, and that may one day eat you. <laughs> and you can watch the whole gruesome act of horror on your computer screen in your iTunes window as the little man crawls along the line, and he only ever gets to the end of the song, and he shot right back to the beginning. And now you can make him skip ahead to his future. I'll go back to his past, but he's always in this finite space. It's exact trajectory. One that either ends in a fade out or just abruptly stop. <laughs> Would you like to live in a finite space? Everyone try to squeeze down real small. Get as small as you can. Get small like, like a little bug or a speck of dirt or, or a crumb that fell off the table. And ain't that stuck to you, your shoe? What's left on the paycheck after mommy spent it on you? Do you feel small? Do you feel anything at all? Are you too small to feel? It's feeling even real and that's small it's pretty terrible unless you want to be eaten by bigger things now most of us will be eaten by bigger things slowly over the course of our whole lifetime but we'll only know it late at night when we're laying in bed and we can't sleep and that's sad but once we get big again we can do that by eating smaller things everyone eat I'm munch, 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 come on, let's eat! Munch, 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 I'll eat you up. You are my friend, but I'm gonna eat you up. Munch, 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 the less we get, the bigger we get, consume to live. Don't know what we got until it's gone. 
We reel it in like a big fish and then it floats away out there like a butterfly. So money gets us things that we think are important in the moment. Now, like, like a sandwich or a, a new car or a bouquet of roses or, or this guitar.
turn a tiny bit serious, but uh, you know, so it goes. So, um, let's see, I'll start. Let me just do some adjusting. Um, my investigation into the portrayal of man artists in pop culture began after I watched Jesse and Celeste forever. <laughs> Jesse Abrams, played by Andy Samberg, is an unmotivated artist who spends all day fake looking for a job while eating chips on the couch. This is one reason why Celeste, played by Rashida Jones, decides to divorce Jesse, the aftermath of which is the central plot of the film. At the end of the movie, we see Jesse preparing for a show at Gagosian. <laughs> <laughs> the Gosian Gallery is a monolith in the art world, with 11 gallery spaces, including three in New York and two in London. Artists the Gosian represents include Diane Arbus, Francis Bacon, Jean Michel Basquiat, Joseph Boys, William de Kooning, Marcel Duchamp, Damien Hirsch, Jasper Johns, Mike Kelly. Jeff Koons, Roy Lichtenstein, Takashi Murakami, Pablo Picasso, Richard Serra, Robert Rauschenberg, Cy Twombly, and Andy Warhol. And now apparently Jesse Abrams. <laughs> Although the only art we see of Jesse is a sculpture made of rearranged IKEA desk parts, are we to assume that Jesse's art is worthy of the Gosian representation? Yes. Why? because he is attractive, sensitive, 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 sensitive uh, emotionally complex, and messy. Is this kind of suspended criticality extended to other fictitious artists? Certainly, if they are men. Men artists have this crazy, sexy mystique about them. Look, they're so sensitive. Look, they're so crazy, but not physically threatening. Um, look at how sexy they are when paint gets all over their undershirts. Um, Seductive portrayals of man artists are everywhere in pop culture, but things start to fall apart when you look closely at their cultural product. The art sucks. <laughs> TV writers ask fictitious artists of all genders to perform a specific notion of artistry that is meant to give these characters a level of sensuality, sensitivity, and vitality. I'm most concerned here with man artists because their art is asked to do far more legwork in their storyline, thereby making the disconnect between the quality of their performance of being an artist and the quality of the artwork they produce more evident. While the largely topical or abstract work of women artists is employed to give the viewer a window into that character's emotional life, uh, the largely representational, from memory or imagination, work of man artists is asked to illustrate the personal relationship the man artist has or desires to have with other characters. When we see Maria Diego Reyes' paintings, we are meant to understand her as passionate and volatile. When we discover that the Medusa collage in Clara Fisher's bedroom is a self-portrait, we are meant to come to a better understanding of Claire's vision of herself. When we see Luke Laurent drawing Sarah Walker, Angel drawing Darla and Cordelia, <laughs> um, Matt Hartley's multiple paintings of Ugly Betty, Johnny's painting of him and Max Black kissing, Seymour Little's multiple paintings of his dead wife, and Neville Morgan's painting of Charlotte York's vagina, we in the audience have a better understanding of the relationship these man artists have or wish to have with these characters. In attempting to determine how to find pleasure in an object that can be identified as distinctively an aesthetic pleasure, Gerald Levinson clarifies that pleasure founded in the personal relationships built around the object cannot testify to an object's artistic value. Levinson explains, by contrast, pleasure founded in personal relationships, such as being the cousin of a composer whose concert one is attending, or in the bio biographical idiosyncrasies, as when one likes a painting merely for using a lot of orange, which was the color of one's nursery as a child, or in commercial interests, such as are present when one is the owner of a sculpture receiving mounted bids at an auction, or in individual inspiration, such as when wishing to become cultivated, one is gratified by the feeling of having understood a complex piece of drama for the evidence it provides of progress in that regard, are none of them the sort to testify to an object's artistic value. Pleasure in such cases is taken not so much in the specific artistic complex presented and its structural base, as in the work's accidental and extrinsic connections insofar as they are favorable to one's particular life situation. In fact, attempting to evaluate art separate from the art's ob art object's accidental and extrinsic connections goes against the very history of the artist. The myth of the artist begins not with the recognition of the significance of his art, but with the recognition of significance attached to his art. Whilst recognizing significance in the art would forefront the actual art object, recognition of the significance attached to the art speaks more of the perception of the artist's place and production in context, a context that largely remembers, praises, and benefits men. 
In tracing the origin of the contemporary artist myth, Ernst Christ identifies an image of the artist that evolved in the 16th century. The image of the artist which evolved in the 16th century found its clearest expression in the opinion that wonderful and divine thoughts came into being only when ecstasy complements the operation of the intellect. This is at the same time a reminder which leaves no doubt that the artistic creation rests upon an inner vision, upon inspiration. Thus, inevitably, there emerged an image of the artist who creates his work driven by an irrepressible urge and a mixture of fury and madness akin to intoxication. This idea has its roots, as we have attempted to indicate in Plato's theory of art, but it was not until the Renaissance that painters and, painters and sculptors were credited with possessing genuine ecstasy, thus transformed to the stylus of God. The artist himself was honored as divine being, the religion among whom saints he is counted as the modern day worship of genius. Here Chris points out the recognition of a genius has to do with the recognition of a certain kind of process. In the case of fictitious man artist, the audience takes pleasure in the fulfillment of classical image of the artist through witnessing them emerge from this very process. Messy hair, paint all over their undershirts, art materials thrown about. Furthermore, Chris also uh, traces the greater sexual license granted to artists also to the 16th century artist. The artist's love for his model, which was originally emphasized in order to humanize the artist's attitude to his work, later came to be associated with a popular view of the artist's character. It was linked with the idea of greater sexual license that society granted the artist. In the 16th century, when the painter and sculptor were accepted as members of the community of creative genius, the question assumed a wider significance until ultimately until in the Romantic era, dissoluteness as well as sexual license became bywords for the artist. Writers of fictitious artists make sure to construct their characters as either sexually desirable, desirable and or acting on greater sexual license granted to them as artists. The, art, the audience feels a sense of fulfillment in the performance of a certain kind of artistic process and a certain kind of sexuality as it syncs up with the myth of the artist. This sense of fulfillment arrives even before Luc Laurent turns his drawing pad toward the camera, thereby rendering the artwork that he makes and that Jesse Abrams made to earn him, earn him a spot in Gagosian's celebrity roster irrelevant. So why attempt to isolate and examine the artwork that man artists create when it is presented to us in a narrative and through history as relational? Because it has been made difficult to do so. As a viewer, how am I supposed to not critically analyze a piece of the character's life that is presented as important in the development of the character and the development of the narrative? I can't. As an artist, how am I supposed to not critically analyze the work of characters who are performing my work? I can't. So how do we focus more on the object's specific artistic complex presented in its structural base rather than the work's accidental and extrinsic connections? Thus begins the visual analysis portion of this talk. I have chosen to focus on Luc Laurent from Brothers and Sisters and Angel from Buffy and Angel uh, because the artistry is the most embedded into their respective plot lines uh, because they make the worst art and I would argue because they are the most attractive. At least David Orianas was between 1997 and 2004. Luc <laughs> Laurent, uh, from his entrance into Brothers and Sisters in season four, perfectly, sums this, uh, perfectly performs this kind of artistic process and blatant sexuality that Chris details, thus perfectly embodying the image of the artist. Sarah Walker is lost in the French countryside. Looking for someone to give her direction, she enters into a barn while light French music is playing in the background, <laughs> where she finds Luke, a beautiful French man played by, played by Giles Marini, painting from imagination, drinking wine, and casually eating grapes. Um, although that's not really a good idea if you're painting oil paints, since oil paints contain a number of uh, toxins in them, such as cadmium, which uh, have been proven to cause cancer. So, Long story short, Luke ends up following Sarah to LA where he endears himself to her family because he is sexy enough for the gay, ma gay men and straight women of the Walker clan and uh, nurturing enough for their mother. When his career doesn't go well, he becomes an underwear model. And when his career does go well, he sells work like this in galleries. Uh, even when Luke presents us with an abstract work of art, it is used in the plot line to reflect more on his relationship with Sarah than to eliminate his emotional life. When Luke exhibits this painting, they've broken up. Not knowing that Luke had painted it, uh, Sarah exclaims, It's so beautiful, look at it. The color, the light, it's making you want to touch it. It's so lovely, I love it. There is something about the way the forms are so constrained, and then this line in the middle just flies off the canvas, like it wants to keep going forever. When they run into one another, and Sarah finds out that Luke made this painting, Luke asks her, What did you love about my painting? She responds, the line in the middle, the way it's trying to escape. It reminded me of something I lost. He responds, what if the blue line is not trying to escape, but trying to find its way home? <laughs> <laughs> of course, none of this has anything to do with painting. Uh, this 
isn't a bad painting, it's just bland. It's so balanced as not to distinguish any kind of tone or mood. It's only distinguishing feature, as Sarah pointed out, is the blue horizontal line running through the center of the painting. The, it's the line that's the only thing that is holding the painting together. Without the line, the shapes in the painting would mush into one another and the composition would fall apart. Perhaps this line is distinguishing the painting's composition as worth deconstructing, but the balance it provides inoculates any effect it would have had. It is a merit to be able to carry the weight of the metaphor, but it is also a fault not to be strong enough to resist it. Not only is Luke's painting used to rekindle his and Sarah's relationship through providing an image that could facilitate an apt metaphor, his painting skills are also used to seal the deal in his marriage proposal. Making sure to position one of his paintings directly in the background, Luke bends down one knee and declares, there are only two things I care about in this world. It's my painting and it's you, my love. <laughs> I'm done being scared. If I could be that man again, the man you met at the picnic, the painter. If I could be that man again, could you possibly consider being that man's wife? <laughs> five seasons on Buffy and five seasons on Angel. Angel, played by the then attractive Dave Boreanaz, is <laughs> eager to show them to his colleagues and lovers, and therefore us. Whether on loose paper or on a notebook, these drawings in charcoal, ore, and pencil are of his lovers, Cordelia and Darla, and occasionally the monsters or landmarks that his investigative agency needs to track down. <laughs> uh, Angel's process, at times dem demonstratively obsessive, also closely mirrors the ideal image of an artist from Chris's account. For example, the episode titled Darla opens with an image of Angel, sitting alone, brooding over a sketchbook. The camera pans to show the vast sea of drawings Angel has made, seemingly over the course of a night, all of Darla. The most curious thing about Angel's drawing is that when Angel turns evil, so do his drawings. Good evil uses drawing as an opportunity to actively meditate on his love for Darla and Cordelia, yet Angelus, uh, Angel's evil manifestation, uses his drawing skills to psychologically dismantle the people around him. For example, Angelus draws both Buffy and her mother Joyce in their sleep and leaves the drawings in envelopes and stuff, like next, next to their pillow, like next to her head on the pillow. Uh, these drawings in their detail indicate that he has been watching them while they sleep, and therefore they are not safe. Angel's sweet, I've been watching you, has turned into Angelus' evil, I've been watching you. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, Angelus' drawings are far more compelling than Angel's. Take, for example, Angelus' drawing of Joyce Summer sleeping. Uh, this drawing is not rendered with more skill than Angel's drawings, however, the treatment of the material indicates that Angelus had clear intent when starting the drawing. The paper's folding indicates that the drawing itself was not precious, but rather was uh, important to be drawn because of the message it contained. Its primary purpose was not to produce pleasure, but to communicate information. As Angelus has made his intention with this drawing clear and the drawing's treatment, it is important to judge the drawing based on his intentions. Instead of asking if this drawing brings me aesthetic pleasure, it is important to ask, was this drawing effective in communicating a message? Was this drawing effective in making Buffy fear for her and her mother's lives? Yes. <laughs> Therefore, this is a work of art. However, if I were to ask if this drawing brought me aesthetic pleasure, my answer would also be yes, as this drawing indicates some level of knowledge of the history of portraiture and proficiency with the material. Portraiture, and therefore the surface that it is on, is traditionally upright, and so by rotating the page and creating a horizontal portrait, Angelus allows the viewer to read Buffy and Joyce's sleeping bodies as a landscape, uh, perhaps a reference to the psychological landscape that is the dream world. Furthermore, <laughs> charcoal is very easily smudged, and so only a seasoned artist would know that if you were going to fold up a drawing to send it to the love of your life, that she knows that you could kill her at any moment and would need to spray it with fix it at first. <laughs> Pictures of your crush and quantity weren't readily accessible, so if you wanted to be reminded of your love, to space out, to, to have an opportunity to space out on their face whenever you wanted, you needed to draw them. This drawing looks like that, light-hearted, crushed flower. What is the point of employing the myth of the artist to build an emotionally complex, sensitive, and sensual character if you're not going to ensure that the person you are employing to fabricate this fictitious character's artwork is creating images and objects that are worthy of attention and praise? There is one case that I can think of where the poor quality of the paintings is not only recognized, but plays a part in the construction of the character's social and emotional life. And this is the end. James Franco plays himself. In the film, he shows several paintings that are notably shitty and derivative. Uh, this is the end consists of a series of jokes wherein Seth Rogen, James Franco, Jonah Hill, etc., etc., parody the personas they have constructed and that have been constructed for them in circulation in pop culture. 
The poor quality and derivative nature of James Franco's paintings, and this is the end, is a parody of his pop culture persona as an insufficient Renaissance man. <laughs> the thing about these paintings is that they were not painted only by James Franco, but also by James Franco's friend, Josh Smith, the artist whose artwork these paintings are supposed to seem derivative of. James Franco explains, quote, Josh Smith and I made a series of paintings specifically for the film. It was great because the paintings could comment on the characters and the action and become a real part of the narrative. Josh and I were going to give some of the paintings to Seth and Evan and the people in the movie, and then we were going to make a book out of them, but right now they're just sitting in, a store, in storage at Josh's gallery, luring Augustine in New York. <laughs> this Josh Smith painting, quite similar to the ones that he and James Franco painted for This is the End, sold for $47,161 on July 3rd, 2014. If Loring Augustine sells the paintings from This is the End, I imagine they could get someone to pay something comparable to this figure, or uh, more because it is a product of such a star-studded collaboration. So I would imagine these shitty paintings will not do go down in history as the shitty paintings they are, but rather good paintings made by men who knew that they could get away with making shitty paintings, and having their friends make them shitty paintings as long as they adequately perform the image of an artist. <laughs> In conclusion, for the time being, I ex and also expect for some time to come, fictitious man artists who make shitty paintings, and real man artists who make fictitious versions of themselves who make uh, shitty paintings, <laughs> uh, will suspend their criticality with their performing sensuality, ecstatic messiness, and sensitivity long enough to win praise and earn money incompatible to the quality of the artwork they have produced. But, and this is a glimmer of hope, somehow, James Frankel will still manage to come out looking like a gigantic asshole. <laughs> Well, either Rick Wakeman is here or it's sit time. It's time to sit down and do go to our final portion of the show, which is the actual talk show, -y show talk, talk show, show talk part. And my guest for tonight has the, I think, next to Jared, the only he's the only other person I know with a name in the past tense. Jesse Melvin. Come on up. Jesse, the first question. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. The first question is, why is your last name in the past tense? Well, it was. Oh, good, good. good. <laughs> okay. The second question. Is, thank you, Jared. Uh, what is the most important thing that you know? Well, <laughs> no, I mean, I, as you know from my bio, I'm a lifetime learner. I feel like I learned so much tonight about beautiful messes, about my painters, about my different types of artists. Um, uh, I, 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 I guess that I would say that... Um, <laughs> this is really important. Yeah, this is important. Because we need to uh, know. Let's say television is what's on, so be on it. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, why is television important? <laughs> oh, I, no, I didn't, that's, I did not mean that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, this is the final question. No, it's the second to last question. Um, if your personality could be described as an animal in a vehicle, what animal in what vehicle would you be? Like, for instance, I'm a loris in a bumper car. What would you be? I was going to say loris in a Taurus, but I don't even know what other of those words are. I was going to It would be a Taurus, though, for you, huh? Yeah, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Just, that's just uh, real. We're going to be real. Yeah. Let's just say, um, what kind of an the animal in a vehicle? Like a human on a yoga ball, or... Um, <laughs> we'll let you know when you figured it out. Um, maybe a... Uh, a toy in a Toyota. I mean, it shouldn't be that. It should be... What? <laughs> Anybody else have a... I want to shout out an animal that Jesse is like. A mix. A mix? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. A mix and like a... What, like a jaguar. Did Raven say that? <laughs> what, what kind of an animal? I think it's kind of like a little cubby bear, right? A little teddy bear? A little bear? Oh, yeah. 
What's that? What's that? I was going to say, but yeah. You know you're a band. <laughs> What's the vehicle? Pogo stick. Oh, yes. Oh, a, a, a little bear on a pogo stick in a hot air bowl. There we go. Thank you, Jesse. That's what you are. And I know, I know you had a really great intro at the beginning of our show, all of our show, but um, but something seemed missing, and I'm wondering if there's anything, anyone else you'd like to thank. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's two more sponsors I want to thank <laughs> to begin. Now I wanted to thank um, from from the very uh, deepest part of the show from this whole week. I wanted to thank people at Links Hall, um, beginning with Anna Trier. way in the back, but she would be right here. That's okay. And Roel, you can come on. And coming in just a moment will be Brett Swinney. And obviously tonight would have barely exist on any level without Kelly Lloyd.
who has a, not a cat or a dog, but another kind of pet. Really? Wow, we gotta diversify, guys. Diversify. Okay, can I get everybody who, oh, ah, uh, <laughs> sorry, I saw it on my laptop first. Okay, um, anybody who, who has ever shot a gun?